Hello, everybody. My name is Christoph Corell, and I'm happy to be online with you today to review the role of long-acting antipsychotics in the management of schizophrenia. Let me show you my disclosure information. I've received uh, honoraria and I'm involved in consulting with a number of companies that make medications, including antipsychotics, hoping to develop even better treatments in order to help our patients. What do I want to cover with you today? First of all, what are the reasons for LAI use? How do we characterize different LAI options? What is the efficacy of LAIs versus oral treatments? What are the data of head-to-head -head trials? How about adverse effects? And then looking at, is there an earlier use of antipsychotics in long-acting formulation, something we should consider? And what might be arguments against the use of LAIs? When we reviewed a few years back, some of the factors that are associated with poor outcomes in schizophrenia, you can see on the slide on the left-hand side, fixed risk factors we can know about, but not do much about it. But I also want to focus now on the actionable risk factors on the right-hand side. And as you can see, longer duration of untreated psychosis is one of the most reliable and addressable risk factors. Looking also at com comorbidities, addiction is a negative factor, which is related also to non-adherence. Early non-response, meaning no response at all or worsening, at two weeks of a good dose of antipsychotics has also been found to be a robust predictor of poor outcome down the road. But in addition to longer duration of psychosis before treatment, psychosis after treatment and number of relapses are also very much associated with poor outcomes. Furthermore, greater number of relapses and psychosis after treatment are associated with non-adherence. This is something that's actionable with the currently available treatments and long-acting injectable medications are one of the best ways to identify non-adherence and address it. Why do we want to prevent relapses? There are multiple reasons. First of all, long-term symptoms and disability are higher in patients who have more psychosis on board. It also is associated with an increased risk of suicide attempts 420% higher in a Dutch study. Recent data and data from 15 years ago suggest that there is a subgroup of patients, about one in seven, that will not respond as well anymore after they've had a relapse to the same antipsychotic or different antipsychotics. This is akin to the kindling hypothesis that we've borrowed from neurology where more epileptic fits predisposed to more severe and intractable epilepsy. And the same seems to be true in mood disorders where people who discontinue lithium have a worse outcome even on lithium afterwards, shorter inter-episode intervals, longer illness phases. And this seems also to be true after relapses, breeding in schizophrenia, something that's called secondary treatment resistance. There are also data that there is a progressive decline in brain functioning and also gray matter as patients have longer duration of psychosis. And obviously there is cost to people, their families, and also the healthcare system. Looking at two studies that are about uh, a decade apart, you can see that at three years in first episode patients, two out of three patients, be it in the US on the left-hand side or in Spain on the right-hand side, had a relapse. And if you follow people out to five years, 82% in our hands at Hillside Hospital had at least one relapse. 78% had a second relapse, 84% had a third relapse. Both these studies looked from the beginning of treatment until relapse for the most reliable predictors and uh, there was a five-fold increase in both studies, 500% increase for patients who stopped medication, be it because they became non-adherent or be it because the clinician felt, oh, you have responded, you have a first episode, let us maybe stop the medication. 
So we do know that continuation of medication treatment is the best predictor of not relapsing. Intermittent treatment has also been unsuccessful, meaning stopping medication after a first episode and waiting for prodromal symptoms to occur. There is a 70% greater risk within three months and then about 150% increased risk for patients to relapse when they have, or 250% actually, uh, when they have not had treatment continuation with an antipsychotic. So we do know that continuation of antipsychotic treatment is a very strong factor for people to stay stable. Relapse prevention rates are reduced by 60 to 65% to one third of what they are when patients who are stable stop the antipsychotic. The number needed to treat is about three to five, which is again an enormous effect size. Compare that to statins preventing a cardiovascular event, they are tenfold less effective. 30 to 40 is the NNT for them. Now, being stable on antipsychotic treatment doesn't give you a job though. There was no difference in uh, employment rates, which is true because we need to combine medication treatment with psychosocial interventions. Also, side effects are greater with antipsychotics than with placebo, which makes sense, including anti-Parkinsonian side effects, sedation, and weight gain, but our medications differ with regard to the side effect cluster. There was also an interesting sub-finding that in a meta-regression analysis, looking at predictors of poorer response to treatment, there was a finding that the longer the studies lasted, the less effective the medication was versus placebo. These were stabilized patients, randomized to staying on treatment or going to placebo. How can we explain that longer trial and treatment duration reduces the efficacy of our medications? Are they getting stale and old? Well, you know it from your practice. The longer people need to do something, the less easy it is to do. So even in those patients randomized to trials that are more adherent generally, they become more non-adherent over time as they're asked to remember taking the medication. And this is what you can see here in the sub-analysis of the same meta-analysis published in Lancet, that there was a significantly better relapse prevention with long-acting injectable medications than oral medications versus placebo and that was significant in a subgroup analysis. So LAI seemed to prevent relapses better than oral medications. So what LAIs do we have available? In the United States, there are two first-generation LAIs, flufenazine and haloperidol, the canoate. And there are four different medications, but there are different types of second-generation LAI medications, risperidone microspheres, olanzapine palmoate, two versions of polyperidone, the three, the one monthly and three monthly, and also two versions of our piprazole, maintena, which is once monthly, and the six, once monthly, six weekly or bi-monthly, Aristada, which is our piprazole, Luroxol. How do these medications differ? The old medications are all oil-based. The new medications are all water-based. Why is that? Because our body consists more of water than of oil. And when you bring an oily substance into a cell, there is more pressure and more pain. So the newer formulations all are water-based in order to reduce pain and injection site reactions, which has been successful. Another differentiation is the, the variable dose interval, two weekly with flufenazine, risperidone, and some doses of olanzapine, monthly with haloperidol, polyperidone once monthly, and our piprazole maintainer, six weekly as well as once monthly or two monthly with our piprazole luroxol, and three monthly with polyperidone palmitate. There are different dosages as the patients are started and maintained. 
But one other reason to differentiate those medications is whether or not oral supplementation is needed. There is no supplementation needed with the old flufenazine oil-based medications because they're released rather quickly and therapeutic levels are established early. And there's also no oral supplementation needed with the medications that have booster injections early on, biweekly or higher doses with olanzapine panoate and the one week booster injection for polyperidon palmitate and the beginning in the deltoid where there is more level available because there is a smaller distribution volume. But the two medications require the co-medication orally three weeks with risperidone microspheres as well as aripiprazole and loroxol and by weeks uh, two weeks with aripiprazole main tenor. In general, we have the same molecule in the long-acting injectable versus oral formulation, so we would not expect different types of side effects. As a matter of fact, we might actually expect fewer side effects with the LAI formulation because they have a smoother blood level, less peak trough variation, and a more smoothed out area under the curve. However, there is one side effect for one medication that is more prevalent then with the oral medication. And that is the somnolent sedation coma syndrome that can occur with olanzapine palmoate, which is very water and blood soluble. And this is a mechanical problem. It is not an allergic reaction. So every patient at each injection is at the same risk, which is about one in every 1,100 injections. And it has to do with the fact that if you inject, when you inject, and even if you aspirate and there is no blood, but then inject and there's a laceration of the blood vessel, too much of the olanzapine can get into contact with the bloodstream. And since it's so blood soluble, there can be very high levels within the first three hours after the injection. And that can lead to over sedation and even uh, breathing difficulties. So therefore a three hour observation period is required by the regulators. None of the other medications has that issue. How do these medications do against placebo? These are NNTs, number needed to treat, the smaller the better. And you can see for the regular doses, let's exclude the two, 150 every two weeks of olanzapine, they're all very similar. Polyperidone 5, olanzapine 4, or 5, and aripiprazole 4. So after each fourth or fifth patient, we can prevent one relapse. Interestingly, the duration of treatment before a person goes to placebo matters for the speed and magnitude of relapses. These are three different trials where patients were either stabilized on oral polyperidone, stabilized and then moved to placebo, stabilized on once monthly polyperidone in green, and then moved to placebo, or stabilized on one monthly followed by three monthly polyperidone and then moved to placebo. And you can see, even when patients become non-adherent, we have a larger window of opportunity to get them back into treatment without relapse. The 50% mark is reached after just two months when the oral treatment is withdrawn. Now, these are patients who show worsening and are taken out of a placebo-controlled trial. So the numbers may be a little higher than what you see in clinical care, where we have more tolerance for some worsening. After the once monthly stabilization, it takes about nine months or six and a half months to get to a relapse 50% of patients. So here we have 172 days. And then when you look at the three monthly, it takes actually over a year until 50% relapse. So with long-acting injectables, you are broadening the window of getting people back after you've learned about their non-adherence because a long-acting injectable is both a treatment and an information tool. There is no other way to know the week, the day, the hour when a patient becomes non-adherent than when they don't return for their injection. But in clinical care, we don't compare antipsychotics against placebo, we compare them against oral treatment, so oral versus long-acting. And after an initial meta-analysis had shown some benefits of LAIs, 
but only included 1,700 patients, we repeated the meta-analysis, broadening the search and getting 5,000 patients into the, the meta-analysis and finding in randomized control trials, to our surprise, that there was no difference for, for the long acting injectable relapse or all cause discontinuation rate versus oral antipsychotics. And we scratched our head and asked, why would that be? Because we would assume that people are more maintained if we know that they're taking the medication and they don't have to think about it or uh, have the motivation gap problem every day, 365 uh, days a week as a possibility. So we thought, well, maybe a reason is that these patients are atypical patients because they agree to be in a randomized control trial where they have double blind injections, where they're not as sick, they can actually sign consent forms. And if patients are compliant, obviously it doesn't matter which formulation you give them. So we tested that and found this was true. Actually, non-adherence rates did not differ in these RCTs when it was measured, whether people were giving oral or LAI injections. So we asked, what is a better way of testing the real world meta-analytic benefit of LAIs versus oral treatments? But before I show you that, another way of looking at benefits of LAIs is to enrich the sample for people who are really non-adherent. And this is such a study where patients were allowed to have substance dependence and abuse and had all have had to have been in contact with the law, being incarcerated or in jail. And you can see that in this highly enriched sample, the LAI on top led to far less treatment failure and rehospitalization and even reincarcerations than the oral treatment. Another enrichment that I will show you later is actually patients in the first episode and early phase who also have not yet accepted often that they're sick and who often stop medications, leading to a second and third relapse, where arguably the most is lost in terms of biopsychosocial fabric of their lives. But another meta-analysis we then started was to look at mirror image studies. And these are studies that mirror clinical care. In clinical care, we don't compare Mr. Jones with Mr. Miller, whether one or the other is doing better because we gave them different treatments. No, we take a patient where we do a change, and then we look before and after the change. And that's the mirror. And here you see um, the studies, 16 of 25 studies that we meta-analyzed. These are 6,000 patients in the meta-analysis. And actually in 23 of the 25 studies, we showed the same thing, that the switch, uh, post-switch long-acting injectable phase was significantly better than the pre-switch oral phase. So patients where the clinician felt they're not doing too well or they might not do well in the future, and who were switched, there was a cutting down of the hospitalizations to less than 50%. And that's quite remarkable. Now, the question then is, well, maybe this is partly due to the fact that we observe them forward and they're coming from a bad outcome. So that's a criticism for mirror image studies. But there is a nice study looking at the conversion of people from an LAI risperidone treatment to either LAI polyperidone or going to oral antipsychotics that they can choose. They can choose whatever matches their desire. So that's an advantage of the oral arm. And still you can see that there's a significant difference in relapse rates. Now, why would then in mirror image studies there be such an advantage of the LAI over the oral treatment? These are insurance-based claim data where no patient knows they're being observed as naturalistic treatment, no consent form signed, and these are medication possession ratios. And you can see those patients who were clinically changed to an LAI had only 40% of the time the medication in their hands. That's when they picked it up from the insurance, uh, from the pharmacy. So cut down from that, the, the percentage that they might not even have taken it, you're maybe at 30%. So we prescribe medications and only 30% of the time people have that in their system or less, that's dismal. 
When these high-risk patients are then switched clinically identified to an LAI, the adherence rates doubles, and obviously we have a much higher chance of preventing hospitalizations as we've seen in this meta-analysis. So it's very simple. We most likely overestimate the adherence in our patients when we give them oral medications. And then there is another meta-analysis we just published looking at cohort studies where patients are put by clinicians either on an LAI or on an oral treatment. And generally people are sicker on the LAI and still we found a significant benefit of the LAI for a number of hospitalizations, although patients were actually sicker than patients who were on oral treatment. So a double win. Recently, Jari Tihon from Finland uh, moved to Sweden to the Karolinska Institute, and he's now also publishing data from Sweden and published this very recently in the American uh, JAMA Psychiatry, looking at risk of hospitalization. And you can see that among the 10 top best treatments, it's almost all LAIs. There's also clozapine there, but otherwise LAIs are better than their oral counterpart. And this is nationwide data without need for consenting patients. And it's 100% of the nation's data. And when you look at hospitalization, that was against no treatment. So when patients are on no treatment, but if we look at hospitalization against oral olanzapine, which did actually pretty well here, it was among the two oral treatments, clozapine and olanzapine did a little better, but otherwise we had mostly LAIs. But when we compare now the treatment effects against the patients with olanzapine, you can see that except for clozapine, all LAIs and polytherapy, whatever that means, that's most likely switching, all other upfront treatments are really LAIs. So we see in a nationwide study of 30,000 patient years, clear definition, clearly defined real world benefits of the LAI. And then unpublished data presented in Paris in October at the ECNP meeting, show different curves for mortality, patients dying. And the worst case scenario is patients not taking any antipsychotics. We actually have data from Finland and Sweden to suggest that patients not on antipsychotics die not only more of suicide, but also more of cardiovascular illness, although our medications increase cardiovascular risk. And that is most likely because their healthy lifestyle is worse and their secondary prevention, treatment of hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia is much worse because they are so sick. Second worst are oral and LAI first generation antipsychotics. They are in the middle between second generation drugs and no antipsychotic. Again, nationwide data from Sweden. And the best are second generation drugs. Here we have the orals, and on top are LAIs, although long-acting injectable antipsychotics are generally given to the sicker patients, the ones that have had more illness duration. So clearly an advantage, not only for relapse prevention, but also for mortality for LAIs. And looking at different medications, we can see that again, on top are mostly LAIs. There's here also oral aripiprazole, that has maybe less cardiovascular illness, but otherwise we have mostly LAIs. Now let's look at if at head-to-head -head studies of different LAIs. There was one that compared paliperidone against haloperidol, both are effective antipsychotics. So for all cause treatment failure, there was no difference. Both medications in this veteran affairs trial had similar effects for treatment uh, maintenance. About 60% were without hospitalization or at treatment failure at two years. But what about side effects? There was a significant 10 pound difference, disfavoring polyperidone versus haloperidol. But there was no difference in metabolic values over here but this was an outpatient study, so we don't know whether patients were really fasting. 
there was more akathisia with haloperidol than polyperidone, but there were higher, twice as high, at least for males and three times as high for lactin levels with polyperidone. So we do have to take side effects into account. There were no data mentioned on tardive dyskinesia, which obviously is a big worry about first-generation drugs. And although the AIM score was similar, this cannot really tell us much. Um, the, this cutoff here was not uh, very sensitive. But interestingly, despite the fact that prolactin levels were high, there was no difference in sexual side effects that were measured with the ASEX, the Arizona sexual um, uh, side effect scale. The second study that looked head to head at two long acting injectables looked at two atypicals, aripiprazole once monthly and polyperidone once monthly in a six month study. This was an open study head to head, but with radar blinded assessments for the primary outcome, which was quality of life, which is a confluence of positive and negative symptoms, treatment satisfaction, side effects and functioning. Patients were randomized to 400 of our piprazol with an option to go to 300 once monthly and 50 to 150 of polyperidone using the usual paradigm. Actually in the US, sorry, these, these, these are European data. So um, it's basically uh, going to 234 milligrams from the lowest dose. Population was 18 to 60 years old with a stratified predefined age range sub-analysis of young patients 18 to less than 35 or 35 and above. Patients were mildly to markedly ill and patients were eligible for a treatment switch either due to inefficacy, intolerability or poor adherence. I mentioned Heinrich Carpenter quality of life was the primary outcome. Three of the four domains are functional, but there were also assessments of the key, key clinical secondary clinical global impression scale. Here's the schema. Patients were orally switched to oral aripiprazole 5 to 30 or polyperidone 3 to 12 for three weeks. And then the usual injection interval, day one, day eight, so 234 milligrams followed by 156 milligrams, day eight, and then our piprazole starting at 400 for one month, and then further injections. Here's the patient disposition. You can see that out of 381 screens, three quarters were actually randomized. So that tells you this is a pretty generalizable sample. And out of those excluded, 55 of the 86 patients didn't even meet inclusion criteria. Looking at completers, 57 versus 68%, that's an 11% difference, which is a number needed to treat of nine to stay in treatment. Here's the primary outcome. Both treatments improved quality of life, but less so with polyperidone palmitate then our piprazole main tenor. And you can see that the difference started to become significant as early as week eight. The treatment difference was five points, which is generally considered in the quality of life literature as being also clinically and not only statistically significant. What about subgroups? In chronic patients, there was no statistical difference anymore, but still no inferiority of the partial agonist over the full antagonist. But in first, sorry, in younger patients, the treatment difference doubled from five to 11 points. Let's look at which domains improved. Actually, all domains improved. Common objects and activities, that means hobbies. Instrumental role means whether you're at work or school. Intrapsychic foundations means how do I feel? Am I motivated? Am I withdrawn? Do I have hope? Do I have empathy? Do I want to do things? Do I enjoy things? Here was the most statistical significance between our piprazole and polyperidone long acting injectable. And interpersonal relationships is how much people mix with others. 
What about the clinical global impression? The illness severity, both treatments improved the illness severity, but again, more so with our piprazole main tenor with a sustained separation as early as month five. Here again, less difference, not significant in the chronic patients, but particular difference in the younger patients who are less than 35 years or equal to, who doubled their effect size from 0.22 to 0.44. What about being at work? Well, this was not a study that used psychosocial interventions to bring working about, but one can measure at least the readiness for work. And there is a mean score where our piprazole maintainer did somewhat better than polyperidone, but it's hard to interpret what that means. Looking though at people who were considered not ready for work or school, or here in this case work, they were older, sorry, on polyperidone and then became ready, 17% became ready. But with our piprazole maintainer that also improved quality of life, it was almost 40%, more than double that size. But you may ask, well, these are long acting injectables. How many actually became psychotic? Both treatments worked very well for preventing psychosis in this population, but both can also cause some weight gain and some insomnia, but relatively similar rates, maybe with some less weight gain and less insomnia in this study with our piprazole maintainer. But what about prolactin related sexual side effects. Actually, quite interestingly, when measured with the ASEX, half of the men and two thirds to three quarters of females before entering the study actually complained of sexual dysfunction. That was not different between our piprazole and polyperidone. But at the end of the study, the polyperidone patients did not move with their sexual side effects, but there was a significant improvement and group difference at the end of the study favoring the partial agonist, which decreases prolactin levels. And actually the subgroup that did the best and had the most benefit were the younger patients who may also complain the most about the sexual side effects going from almost one and two to only 16%. So that brings me to side effects. What beyond prolactin should we worry about? Well, the only side effect that's really more with injections than with oral treatments is an injection pain. But here you see the injection side pain on a 100 millimeter visual analog scale. And you can see in green the older treatments that are 20 to 50. So if you break this down to a 10 point scale, two to five points. But the newer agents are really 0.5 to one point only, five to 10 which shows you how well they are tolerated. We did a meta-analysis looking at side effects, including also at least one side effect with LAIs versus oral treatment. And there was no statistical difference as you can see here. These were studies, randomized studies that compared patients randomized to the same medication orally or in an LAI formulation. Out of 119 side effects, actually 115 or 97% were the same. There were three somewhat more with LAIs, akinesia, likely due to the first generation antipsychotics that are released quickly. More LDL cholesterol increase, which is likely due to more adherence and weight gain and the anxiety I cannot explain, but the less peak trough variation led to lower prolactin change and less hyperprolactinemia with the long acting treatment. Looking at death rates, when you can't remove patients from an LAI, when a serious side effect occurs, this does not seem to drive the events of mortality. And we've seen the Yari T. Home study, actually LAIs had lower mortality than oral treatments. We are just finishing up with a meta-analysis of cases, 700 pace cases, of neuroleptic malignant syndrome in the world's literature. And again, found no difference 
in mortality rates or sequelae after NMS, whether or not patients could be stopped immediately with an oral treatment or the washout took longer, again showing the safety of LAI treatment. So that, asks, that leads then to the question, who should get LAIs and when should we start them? Prior guidelines reserved LAIs for chronic patients who had had a lot of relapses before. But then the horse is out of the barn. It is too late. Patients have already had adverse effects of the illness. They have learned hopelessness, have become chronic, and they don't respond as well anymore. Newer guidelines now suggest that LAIs should be offered across each phase of the illness based on data that I will show you. One data set is helpful because it's nationwide. It's another T-home study from Finland where patients were first episode patients, first time ever hospitalized in Finland. 100% of patients in Finland hospitalized for a first episode of schizophrenia between the time of 2000 to 2007. And then clinicians decided, who do I discharge on an oral or on an LAI medication? And you can imagine those not having psychosocial support, having less illness inside, having shown that they're not as adherent outside before they came in, were more likely to get an LAI. So in effect, you're stacking the deck against the deck. But even with that, when looking at relapse measured as hospitalization rates, there was a reduction to one third of the relapses like with placebo, basically, you're giving these first episode patients the same effect size as against placebo when you have an LAI on board and all cause discontinuation similarly. They also measured how many patients after 30 days post discharge went to the pharmacy and picked up their medication just 30 days later, one month after the supply ran out from the hospital. What would you guess first episode patients first time hospitalized and discharged in Finland, how many did not come back just 30 days later and became non-adherent? 20%, 30, 50, 70? What is it in your mind? Well, as a matter of fact, in this study it was 50%. How many got an LAI? 5%. How many get an LAI in the United States? Eight to 10%, but we do know that 60 to 70% at the end of one year are non-adherent. And I'll show you some data to that effect. So database studies will not change the guidelines. What will change guidelines are RCTs. Here we have one where patients were within five years of illness and were randomized to polyperidone palmitate once monthly or any oral trial that they wanted to have. Again, favoring the oral because you can switch within oral medication and select what you think is best. But even with that, there was a reduction by one third looking at the LAI versus the oral treatment. So basically a 30% risk reduction. The most impressive study to date is this, an academic study done at UCLA by Keith Nüchterlen and Ken Subotnik, where only 86 first episode patients were randomly assigned to either oral risperidone or long-acting injectable risperidone. And at the end of one year, there was either a one in three relapse rate in the oral group or a five out of a hundred. If you had a son or daughter with first episode schizophrenia, do you want the risk of one in three being sick again or five out of a hundred? And when you do a Kaplan-Meier, and estimate the, the rate at the end of one year is actually one in two patients on the oral treatment versus eight out of 100 on the LAI. How is that possible? Why is there such a huge difference? Well, look at the excellent adherence rates, which mean that you're almost missing no medication. At the beginning of treatment, both groups, because they were randomized, were in the mediocre range. They weren't poor, but they weren't great either. But at the end of the year, there's only a 33% excellent relapse uh, um, adherence rate to oral treatment in the Risperdal arm. 70% are not doing well enough. But look at this. 
95% want the needle. How is that possible? Are they so eager to get an injection? Do they really want the weight gain with the medication, the sedation, the prolactin elevation and sexual side effects? Of course not. But the moment they stop, everybody knows. So we can take action and keep people stable. And we can actually link the stability to the medication intake. The problem is that when patients unbeknownst to us stop medication, the first they learn after stopping is that they feel better. They have less side effects and they don't have a relapse. And then when they relapse three or six months later, oh, what has that to do with the medication? So they have a false learning that stopping is good. Whereas people who continue and are doing well, you can link in motivational interviewing that will talk about this outcome. So what are some of the arguments? When should we give the medication? We should give it in first episode patients, in those with good therapeutic alliance, high level of participation, open to treatment. Even if they're adherent now, they most likely will become non-adherent. So offering the treatment is important not giving it at the far end of the spectrum. But what do clinicians say? These are German psychiatrists. 86% say, oh, I don't need to use an LAI because my patients take the medication. 86%. Well, that's really an overestimation. And data suggests that clinicians are quite good at knowing how non-adherent their colleagues' patients are because that's not the usual patient, of course, it's 60, 70% are non-adherent and why are they then prescribing oral treatment? I don't know, but for our own patients, oh no, they are doing only poorly because of the illness. Well, 80% say my patients don't want the treatment. Well, let's look at the study where patients were asked. So 80% said refusal is one of the primary reasons for not prescribing it. But then patients were asked and actually 80% said, I've never been informed about that option. And in that study, three quarters of psychiatrists said, I informed my patient, but only 3% could confirm that. And data after data suggest people have had at least one injection and have an experience with what they otherwise don't know, have a pretty good or not a negative aspect or assessment of long acting treatments but presentation matters. This is a nice study published by Peter Wyden, where there's a discourse analysis of 33 recorded conversations where psychiatrists offered a long acting injectable to a patient. The psychiatrist focused on 91% of the time on the modality, how the injection is done. It's a shot and only 9% why that could be a benefit. So with that approach, only 33% said they might want to take an LAI. Then another physician came who was trained on how to present LAIs and actually the rate went from 33 to 96% of accepting an LAI. Yes, we can, but we have to be convinced that this is a treatment option for many, many patients. But we need to do motivational interview. And it shouldn't be like this. The new screensaver was created by a motivation expert. It's a slideshow of former employees who were fired for poor performance. And this is how we often pre present LAIs. Oh, you became non-adherent. You can't do this by yourself. Here's the needle. That's not how we should do it. Well, what about shared decision-making? It's not my way or the highway anymore. But we can't delegate the decision to the illness. If a patient says, I don't want the treatment, we can't take a neutral stance and say, oh, that's fine. Um, you need to learn your illness. How would you feel if you just had a heart attack, came back to your clinician, your cardiologist, and say, I don't want to take the statins and the antihypertensives. I hate that stuff. And the clinician then would say, oh, that's fine. Once you have a second heart attack and you survive it, let's talk again. No, we need to inform patients what's important and what has the best chance of keeping them stable. And what's important is to know where the patient is. Pre-contemplation, oh, why should I take this? Maybe yes, maybe no, hmm, I'm not so sure. The important thing is the action button, trying it out and giving the argument, why don't you try it just once, then I'll leave you alone. And it's, the discussion is not a one-shot deal, no pun intended. 
it's a process. And then once somebody is on the treatment, we need to review treatment goals and also adjust treatment as needed. So we need to find the goal for the patient. And it may not be reducing symptoms. It may be, I want to stay in the basement with my parents. I want to have a girlfriend. I want to have at least enough money to smoke a cigarette. So the win-win situation would be like this. The physician talking to the obese patient who doesn't want to exercise. What fits your busy schedule better? Exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? What fits your busy schedule better? Coming once a month or even fewer for a treatment, 12 or six or only four treatments a year and being having the highest chance of being stable or taking something once a day and faltering, forgetting, being readmitted and getting treatment over objection or short acting injectables where you don't wanna have them. What fits your busy schedule better? So I'm eager to hear your thoughts on the presentation let me sum up before we have time for questions. In schizophrenia, non-adherence and relapse are extremely common and they are the primary driver of poor outcomes that we can address. If I told you that uh, the MHC gene, or the major histocompatibility complex gene that came out in the meta-analysis at the highest is associated with poor outcome or the mismatch negativity or a smaller hippocampus, you could only shrug your shoulders. You can know it, you can't even assess it most of the time, but you can't do anything about it. But improving the outcome from one in two people relapsing in a year to eight out of a hundred, that is doable with just changing the treatment paradigm and offering an LAI. Because when we believe that people 50, 60, 70% are non-adherent, at least not as adherent as we think they are, why are we then prescribing the medications? They are oral prescriptions, but they're not taken as prescribed, particularly in schizophrenia. So LAIs are valuable, but highly underutilized across the globe, but particularly in the United States. In Spain, there are 20 to 30%. Similarly, 30% uh, and higher in Australia and about 20% in France. Why are we lagging behind so much? And with first generation LAIs, there was a higher in intake. The LAI use dropped after oral atypicals became available. We need to look at different design issues when we evaluate the data, but also look at attitudes of patients, families, and of treatment team members, unless a clinician is convinced he or she will not be able to convince a patient. Greater and earlier LAI use can help preserve psychosocial functioning, prevent deterioration, stigma, and self-stigma. Very important. But whenever we choose medications, we obviously need to also look at risk-benefit ratios of the individual treatments. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to questions. Any question about data, or if you have questions about the approach, does that match your experience in, in your clinical care? I think it would be great to just bring some people on. I can just tell you what's, what's cooking in that um, realm. Um, Janssen is currently doing their six monthly polyperidone studies. They're on their way. So we may at one point not have seasonal treatments, spring, summer, fall, and winter, but only twice annually treatments for people who've obviously graduated from the once monthly, at least four injections, four months, to the three monthly, to the six monthly. And there are also companies currently looking at subcutaneous long-acting injectable antipsychotics, which might even be better tolerable and also palatable for clinicians and patients to either offer or accept. But this will not come to the market before 2020 and beyond. There are only pharmacokinetic studies ongoing right now, but it's at least, it seems to be in reach. Are there any tactics to use in adolescence? Um, this is a very important question. I'm both an adult and a child psychiatrist. And unfortunately, the companies got a waiver from both the FDA and the EMA that they don't have to study this in a pediatric program. I think that's a mistake because non-adherence is at least as common in adolescents as it is in adults. And the illness, schizophrenia, expresses itself very, very similarly. So we only have academic data and currently only case series and case reports. But since the brain of an adolescent that has schizophrenia is very similar, I would say once you have established the oral dose, you can offer an LAI. 
because patients will benefit from this. They also, when they're in college and they are in dorms, they may not want to uh, have other people see that they take medication. They might want to go on a binge on a weekend and usually they then stop the medication here. They have something on board when they travel. So basically it's the same tactic as in adults. You just have to inform the families and the patient that this is off label. Which product has the longest period between injections? Okay, let me review this again. Uh, olanzapine uh, has a two weekly injection as well as Risperdal Consta. Olanzapine also has monthly injections as has polyperidone once monthly and the two versions of our piprazole. Longer than once monthly is one version, one dose of our piprazole or Ruxel, which is either six weeks or eight weeks. And then the longest currently is polyperidone palmitate three monthly. And that is given after at least four once monthly injections uh, with, or five injections or so four months of uh, polyperidone palmitate. And you can then go to the three monthly that is four injections per year. I don't do this before I'm at six months of treatment because there is still a steady state that's building up until six months. And I don't want to uh, lose a patient by maybe having some side effects if I go after four months. But the trials were done four months of polyperidone once monthly, and then you go to the three monthly, I do it after six months. So polyperidone palmitate, three monthly, Trivicta currently, uh, or Trinza, depending on which country you're in, um, has the longest period between injections. And also longest grace period uh, until you, when you can just inject again and don't have to use uh, oral treatment when they come back later, but then, then the injection interval would have been, but that is something that you find in each of the package inserts. Okay, would you add, would you consider adding clozapine? Now, this is a very interesting question. Um, so obviously clozapine can lead to agranulocytosis in a very small number of patients, less than, or, or leukos, leukopenia. And uh, that is usually the, um, the, the, the point early in treatment. So basically I would not add clozapine to an LAI, but you, now the follow-up question is also, when would you consider clozapine? So basically I would never give clozapine as an add-on to an LAI, but let's say you have clozapine on board and the patient is now on monthly blood draws as shown that they don't have these early um, um, a problem with either myocarditis or also a granulocytosis, then you could potentially add an LAI if you're not sure that they're always taking the clozapine. Um, some people say don't do it because what if that also lowers the white count, but you can always stop clozapine. So I would say I might add an LAI to clozapine, but later after six months or so of clozapine treatment in order to see whether I can get more outcome. In a recent uh, paper that we did on uh, treatment resistant schizophrenia published in American Journal of Psychiatry, Oliver House is the first author, I'm the last author. We actually as a group, an international panel of I think 40 uh, experts and clinicians um, recommended even before considering somebody is really treatment resistant, we want people to have at least one trial of an LAI for three or four months because only then can we say that it's not pseudo resistance that is triggered by insufficient intake of the medication, but that they're really failing oral first, uh, sorry, that they're failing first line antipsychotics and then clozapine could, could be used. So we should really rule out non-adherence as a reason for a partial or incomplete response and pot potential resistance. It's interesting, it's, it's nice that each of your questions were beyond the slide deck. So it seems that the content was pretty clear and digestible, but the question is how to translate it into the real world. So let me maybe uh, just um, address the last question, which is how to incorporate LAIs into clinical care. So I think uh, it's not a one-shot deal that you say it just once, do you want the needle? No, you have to build it up but also what I do is I bring in the LAI when I start the oral treatment. 
Here we have a couple of options. They have these and those side effects. Some of them can be given 12 times or <clears throat> four times a year. So let me see whether we, you will respond and tolerate the oral medication, but we will then, once you're stable, talk about the LAI. So it's not an afterthought. It's a, it's a different treatment paradigm. Once we're in maintenance, now the LAI kicks in. And I think once patients realize that, that can be very helpful, that they're prepared and that you continue uh, discussing it. You can also bring into the picture that actually they get less medication. So if you take our Piperazole Maintena, for example, 400 milligrams is equivalent to 22 milligrams or 21 milligrams oral times 30 would be 600 uh, 30 milligrams, but we give only 400 or even 300. And the same is true for the other medications. Since it's a smoother peak trough variation, we give patients less medication. And there are some data to suggest that that may be even more protective to the brain. We're waiting for uh, more, uh, more imaging data, but it's a smoother way of treating the illness. And people don't have to fall into the motivation gap or forget and are generally better treated. And I think that should be our argument. When you can't get through, having peer counselors can be very helpful. So people who have been on LAIs and were maybe against it before and can talk to the patients. Thank you very much for your attention.